everyone. Welcome to your Enneagram Coach, the podcast. I'm Beth McCord, your Enneagram Coach. And wow, today is going to be a really fun day because I have got two of the most special guests ever. Yep, they are my kids, Nate and Libby. So of course they're special, right? I'm maybe a little biased, but that's okay. Um, So Jeff and I are going to interview Nate and Libby because my new book, Enneagram for Moms, is coming out next week on July 9th, which is actually Libby's birthday. Um, And so we've been doing interviews with moms of the different types and listening to their stories and hearing what it's like from their perspective. But I thought it would be really fascinating and interesting for you to hear what it's like for two adult kids, because they're both 23 and 25 right now, what it was like for them to grow up with the Enneagram, to literally be raised with parents who use the Enneagram on a daily basis. I learned about the Enneagram when they were one and three years old. And so even though I was growing and learning, I was also utilizing that knowledge as I raised them. And so I thought it would be really helpful for you guys to hear from two people that are now adults what that was like, the highs, the lows, the frustrations, uh, the benefits. So with that, I hope you guys will order my book, Enneagram for Moms. All you got to do is go to Enneagramformoms.com to get the book. We have plenty of options for you to select a retailer there. Um, You can also listen to it through Spotify and Apple Music. We really want you guys to engage in this book and dads that are listening, this book is just as valuable to you to learn about your type and how you might parent, but also to learn about your wife and what it's like to be a mom. So with that being said, let us jump right in to the interview with Nate and Libby. Hey, well, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, But uh, hey, today, uh, Beth, we're going to be talking with our kids about uh, the Enneagram and our family life. Um, You've heard a little bit of the story before, but we'll go through that again. Uh, Beth's going to be releasing her new book, Enneagram for Moms, which is uh, a long time standing, like she's been wanting to do a book on parenting for a long, long time. And so, uh, but we'd like to give an opportunity for our kids to talk about what it was like to grow up in a home where the Enneagram was just a very popular topic, whether we were talking with, to them about it, which I don't remember talking a lot about it with them, Mm-mm. not until they were a lot older, but uh, it, it certainly we were talking about it with other people. So Yeah, <laughs> <They> were, <laughs> and processing it in our own mind. Sure. Yeah, because we started learning about the Enneagram back in 2001 when Nate and Libby were one years old and three years old. So this is way back in the day. So I'm just curious. So Nate and Libby, um, do you remember when you started to think about this Enneagram thing, how young you were? Probably elementary school. I think that's when we were trying to find at least my type. Yeah, I remember trying to find, or like talking about Nate's type. I don't think we talked about mine until middle school. Nate, do you remember what that experience was like trying to find your type? Well, he wasn't in elementary when we found his type. Right. Yeah. But do you remember those early conversations about your type? Was that a pleasant experience? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't exactly remember what intrigued me about it, but I definitely know that I kind of played along and was just like, yeah, I'll answer the questions. Um, I know, mom, you went back and forth a lot between two and one, um, which makes a lot of sense for me being a social six, um, pretty much fits the bill as to why those two types would be what we were thinking about. Um, so, yeah. And your tri-type being a 612 as yeah. well. So it wasn't too far off. Um, and sixes are some of the most helpful on the Enneagram, but for their own reasons. And so, you know, it really, you know, did make a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, I think you were 14 when we took like more of the kind of <clears throat> the official test and mm-hmm. The official test, uh, or so to speak, um, those are air quotes, um, had you land on a six and I had you read about it and was like, yeah, so what do you think? Do you remember that time? Yeah, I believe so. Um, I mean, not 
it's not too strong of a memory, but I definitely remember us just kind of being like, oh, yeah, that's it. It was just mm-hmm. kind of immediate, like, yep, that makes sense now. Mm-hmm. I can't remember, yeah. Dad, had you already found out that you were a counterphobic six? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Is, is that right? Yeah. The reason why is, like, I'm I'm remembering, Nate, the whole incidents. Uh, so we had our computer in our house in Normal, Illinois, uh, near where the piano was and we were mm-hmm. kind of working on it over there and you were on the couch and I can kind of just remember like talking through it over there but Jeff found well, and just to remind people I I thought I was an eight for probably the first five years that right. we were using so the Enneagram that was pretty much from 2001 to 2005 ish mm-hmm. six ish um, and so that's you found out pretty much when we kind of were moving towards yeah. back to Illinois. So, um, so yeah, so Nate, dad had known for several years. And so in, in some ways that is probably why I didn't, wasn't at first seeing you as much of a six, um, because dad being more counterphobic six, you weren't really showing up that way. You were very much a rule follower, compliant. Um, and so, yeah just a very, very different experience, but it was really neat to kind of finally land on your type. Libby, do you remember us kind of helping you find your type? Yeah, I remember us thinking I was a nine for a while, which made a lot of sense. I very much did whatever is most helpful in the family, but I was definitely more outgoing and willing to intrude than you ever were. And I don't think we didn't realize that until we moved to Nashville. So around 13 or 14. And that's Mm -hmm. when I actually took like the official test and it said two and we were reading it and I was like, this makes a lot more sense. And then I think it took a couple weeks after that, you were really reading up on the two to see and to like understand me better. And you would come in my room and be like, do you relate to this? And like some of the stuff I'd be like, how do you know that? (laughs) I remember one time you were like, do you ever like wish that people take care of you when you're sick so you kind of exaggerate how you feel and i was like maybe <laughs> like why are you asking <laughs> that um kind of like kind of like you felt like you were caught <laughs> yeah and you were just like curious you were just reading a book to me and i'm like maybe um yeah and then i remember one time we were heading to a family friend's house and we were bringing them a pie from sam's and oh, i yeah. like was sitting in the back seat and i hated it i was like hate that we have this pie like I didn't make it homemade they're gonna hate it they're not gonna feel loved and I finally like vocalize it to you because I realized this probably isn't a normal thought and you were like but we got them something like isn't that amazing and I was like no it's not enough (laughs) so yeah yeah yeah. because you wanted to really show someone that you cared by baking it yourself I I am curious was I in the car because I kind of resonate with that. I, I would have preferred to have made something. Oh, yeah, that's totally you oh, too. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> me is, and, and I'm not saying all nines are this way, but as a nine, I was like, let's go the easy route. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm willing to do something. Yeah, uh, you wanted of to course, show. But let's not exert too much <laughs> ever, right. effort. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I would love for you guys to share, like, separately, your own specific experience or incidents Um like a positive impact that the Enneagram has had on you. And let's I mean, start that, with when you were younger, like it, and it could be any age when you're younger and then maybe like how is impacting you now? Yeah. It, I would say it's primarily uh, affecting me in positive ways. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as a kid, I would say, you know, we landed on my, type in middle school and I think it helped um clear up some things for me as I was going through middle school definitely more into high school um as to like how I related to classmates or teachers you know constantly kind of having trouble with authority figures um that I didn't feel like kind of rose up to the expectations that I had for them. Um, But then, you know, we constantly saw a pattern where my loyalty was overused, both by myself and by others. Um, 
So, for instance, like, I had gotten the opportunity to play for a really, really good travel soccer team um, and decided to stay with the team that I was with that wasn't doing so great and was pretty difficult to stay a part of. But I felt like, not in, like, a prideful way, but more so, like, oh, they need me, like, we need everyone, like, I should stay kind of thing. And I don't like to play the regret game, but um, let's just say the travel team would have been fun. Um, (laughs) And so, yeah, so I think it helped clarify those things and Mm -hmm. continued to help um, in those ways. And so now I would say I use it on a almost daily basis in terms of understanding my own language um, and how I communicate to others as well as um, others communicating towards me. Um, Mm -hmm. And so for instance, like, you know, the other day I was just worried about this relationship that I have and um, just some own internal head trash and thinking that it was going to be too much like, negative things about me or that I think are negative things were going to be too much for this person. Um, And before I was able to react to the situation, I was just able to kind of check in with myself and realize like, okay, I understand that these are fears and just kind of acknowledging it, um, empathizing with myself and that part of me, and then just kind of, walking myself through like is this reality is there anything they've done to show that's a concern um and there wasn't and so Mm -hmm. um i was able to explain to the person later on like um hey this is kind of what happened um Mm -hmm. you didn't do anything but this is just kind of what i had to do internally um and so Mm -hmm. yeah it's helped me a ton wow libby what about you You're muted. You're muted. Here we go. Um, It definitely helped me a lot in childhood, just understanding as a two how much I want to help other people. Because in the same way of being used in that way of like, I'm always a person who's willing to listen and to help and to be the friend that's there. Um, Mm -hmm. And especially as a kid, like you go through so many friendships because you're children. And as a two, you can feel like it's your fault and you need to do X, Mm -hmm. Y, and Z. And especially when you're friends as a kid, I mean, other kids don't have emotional regulation and like think through things. And so you're also like, well, maybe I should help this person when in reality, they're not being very nice or whatever. Um, So it helps me have more like care for myself and willingness to stand up for what I thought I deserve to be treated by and all that. Um, It helped a lot with school. I was a huge, like, I need to make every teacher happy with everything I do. And it took me till the end of college to finally realize that that wasn't (laughs) true. (laughs) So, um, but it was definitely something that I was aware that I was doing, even if it was really Mm -hmm. hard to fight against. Um, So yeah, it it also obviously helped as a family. Um, I mean, having that system as a foundation throughout childhood Mm -hmm. that I understood myself, but also felt like you guys understood me helped a ton because there was a lot of things that, you know, as you grow up, you feel like your parents don't understand or maybe don't even care to understand you or your siblings. And to know that our family was constantly trying to get to know each other and be curious about each other was really helpful. I was just curious. I, you know, we didn't, go into we didn't start a coaching business for many years mm-hmm. and nate was a head was had just left when all that was kind of yeah. getting started when it was getting much bigger yeah and was there ever a time that you were tired of us talking about the enneagram i think there there's the only thing i could think of is if moments that didn't we didn't want to be like more in depth like a heart to heart like we only got disciplined by having heart to hearts we never got grounded like there's very few times where y'all were like we're actually going to punish you for something and it was if something was like really big but most of the time it was like we're gonna sit at the kitchen table and talk about our feelings and like it always helped 
but it was super obnoxious sometimes because I'm like, okay, yeah, just want to be grounded and not have a heart. Like heart you, you're probably with your friends and they're like, yeah, I got grounded. And you're like, yeah, well, I got talked to again. <laughs> <laughs> like it always baffled me because like parents would like take their phones away or whatever. And I'd be like, but did you guys not talk about it? Like, did you guys not say like, here's why I did that. And here's what I could have done better. And here's why I reacted that way. <laughs> like that was just how our family handled things. So I was like, well, how's that going to help anything? You guys didn't talk about anything. So that's well, and, I'm... and I'd love to hear from your perspective, like, cause even just saying that, I think a lot of families it's one sided, like the parent asking, why did you do that? You know, or what's going on, you know, and like very upset and disappointed. What was your perception of, of how we use the Enneagram in, in those ways, both to be curious about you and what's going on, but also to inform ourselves or to help you know about us? Like, what yeah. was that like? I mean, I think a big difference that I saw in our family was the curiosity was because we were a team. And I think that's carried into adulthood a lot is like, we were not just curious, like you guys weren't just curious because you wanted to punish us or you wanted to tell us why we were wrong, but you were curious as to there. It always felt like you guys believed the best in us and that we just weren't acting that out. And you wanted to understand how can we get from that to a good action as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really helpful because instead of just hearing like, why did you do this? You guys would say like, okay, this is what happened. Like, why did you have this? And it, it truly felt like you knew we had our best intention or we cared a lot. We just, as a kid, can't always do the right thing and it's really hard. Mm -hmm. And so you guys wanted to equip us with the knowledge of let's be self-aware and let's think about this. Um, and of yeah. course, like our family was never perfect at it. And we had big fights and all of that. <laughs> like, it's not like we just always sat down and had a kumbaya moment, but right. it also was very helpful because even in those moments, you guys also would then explain your own trash. Like if you guys got mm. too upset at us, you would come back yeah. and do the exact same thing you would ask us to do of self work and then explain it and apologize. And I don't know very many people who have parents who apologize or have apologized as much as you guys have throughout our childhood. Mm. And so- Well, there's a lot to apologize. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm just curious, have either of you uh, contracted with a literary agent to write the uh, expose <laughs> on, I grew up an Enneagram child? Like, all <laughs> right, whatever, we can all profit from it. <laughs> right, right. Um. Well, did you guys ever feel stereotyped or presumed upon? Well, for instance, like just for the listeners, I just you know, feel like we the always... stereotype. <laughs> well, <laughs> we you... always talk about don't use the Enneagram as a sword or as a shield. Right. So instead of going, oh, Nate, you're being such a six or well, I'm, I'm a nine guy. So just you're going to have to live with it. We we try to teach not to do that. At times, we all have, and some people more than others. I'm looking at myself. Um, well, you're looking at me making fun of yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that's kind of where the, the question kind of comes from. Did you feel that we either overused, incorrectly used, or maybe even a better way of asking it is, you know, parents are out there listening and they're kind of wondering like, how how do I use the Enneagram in a way that my kids would find it beneficial, that they would feel helped, that they would feel nurtured, seen, attuned to? Maybe that's really kind of the question we're after. I um, can maybe speak to this a little bit, um, just in what I've seen in my own coaching with parents and and their kids where, and this is also partly answering your last question, that what the way in which you guys showed us how to use the Enneagram was showing us that the work, that relationship starts with doing your own work first. Um, mm -hmm. That it's not, oh, let me help them. It's no, you got to help yourself first. Um, mm -hmm. And so for parents to realize they need to understand what it means to care for themselves, to emotionally regulate on their own, and then to be able to help their kids. And the way they do that is through attunement and engaging with who their kid is 
not who they see their kid becoming or who they want their kid to be. Um, Mm -hmm. But just asking them, who are you in this instance? Um, And that's where you'll see kids respond. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of the time we just see a question being asked for the sake of the result instead of actually asking out of pure curiosity and wanting to understand and empathize with the kid for who they are at the current moment. Hmm. Yeah. Libby. Yeah. I think, I mean, with the Enneagram, it, Nate said it right. Like, and now that I have my own child, like I constantly am thinking we're raising a human that is not meant to just fit in our family perfectly. Like you find someone who you want to marry because they compliment you so well and they challenge you, but you're not growing a human to do that same thing. You're growing them to be the best version of themselves. And at that, like in that sense, you'll still love them and care for them. And that way you'll be close and be family. But I think you guys challenge yourself to do that of there's a lot of ways that we've butted heads, but you guys also know, like, this could be their greatest strength. And it's hard as a parent to be that, you know, landing pad of, all right, you're going to launch off and it's going to be very difficult because it's not going to feel good all the time, especially Mm -hmm. because you guys raised two stronger willed children who have, you know, tried to carve their way into the world. But Mm -hmm. you guys, I feel like you guys just knew like these kids aren't supposed to fit like, I'm not supposed to be a nine that just fit the mold of doing everything a certain way. And Nate, as a six Mm -hmm. who wants to conform to the rules and all things, you guys didn't use that against us. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think as as a parent, when I look at the Enneagram, it's like, can I be curious about my kid and fall in love with the person that they're becoming and not just try and pigeonhole them into like a type that I wish they were or whatever. Mm -hmm. What was it? Yeah, I was... This is more uh, funny, if that's okay. <laughs> what do you think is the sexiest thing that I have passed down to you guys? The funny thing is, both of you guys have passed down very sexy things. That's <laughs> very true. So, <laughs> so, for the audience to know, I was raised by a phobic six and married a six. I have a son who's a six. And my closest friend is a six. <laughs> I'm surrounded by sixes. But yes, growing up with my mom, I definitely took on a lot of six characteristics. And then I'm connected to the six with, you know, the line and the arrows. So that is So very what would true. you say would be the sexiest thing that we've passed down? I feel like is I... Is there a phrase? I, like, for me, it's... Well, okay. One thing that I actually have told Mark so many times that I'm implementing in our parenting is if you're going to be dumb, just don't be dumb about it. Like, be smart about being dumb. Like, you've always just instilled, like, if you're going to do something dumb in life, at least be smart at it. <laughs> just do it with some so truth. Be, be street smart is yeah. what you're saying. That's such a counterphobic six. I was just thinking. Oh, that is amazing. So like, I, I've, not, I've not really thought about that, but that is a very... <laughs> be, be, be prepared and calculated hey, i remember your... telling you guys like hey hey if you're gonna do this just let's be just be, be don't be dumb <laughs> i don't know if i use those terms but i definitely coached you on how to make mistakes <laughs> <laughs> and it's like That's either funny. that or i like research the crap out of things before they happen and my husband is always like hey maybe that's not always helpful like maybe you <laughs> yourself out before it even happens so there's so many things with our yeah. son where i'm like oh, i don't Beth need to research never said that to me like you know you may be overthinking it <laughs> or do you really have to go do all the i love research? i love the time we we hopped on the highway jeff and i this was not long ago like two years ago or three years ago hopped on the highway and after about five minutes i was like because my brain was offline. I was just like looking out the window, not really thinking like a good nine does. And I looked at him. I'm like, so what are you thinking about? And he took me up on it. And he told me all the things he had been thinking about in the last five minutes. And I was exhausted. You were upset. I was. I was like, he just took that dump truck and dumped it all on to I, me. I just answered your question. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah anyway a better um, question would be like what, what have you been thinking about for the past 10 seconds because that yeah, would that might still overwhelm narrow it, it down to yeah. about <laughs> five minutes well 
What's the ninest thing that well, wait, mom? Wait, Nate didn't respond. Oh. Yeah. What was the sixiest thing that dad or I, I guess, passed down to you? I mean, he passed down that I'm a six. So <laughs> um, it's genetic. It, yeah, it's a congenital. Problem. No, right. <laughs> I mean, you know, there are definitely questions about that of the whole nature versus nurture thing, and I would say that. Um, yeah, a lot of my thoughts are, you know, kind of a combination, but um, I definitely remember this was several years ago when I graduated college, moved to seminary, and I was thinking about buying these speakers for um, like a turntable set and listening to vinyls, and um, I just couldn't pull the trigger. And dad, you were like, what's wrong? And I was like, well, I've got you guys in my head, like. <laughs> just got like uh but like you could use that money for something else and all and like what about this just, what about that yeah like graduation money or like money that i would gotten for my birthday like just you know like i was completely fine to spend it and then a week later you're like yeah i might get the same speakers and i was like just do it and you're like ah, i don't know and i was like well what's wrong <laughs> and you're like well, I've got myself in my head, and so <laughs> you don't know what you don't know, and and so I'm like I, I I'll just if the longer I wait, the more reasons I'll come to understand how to make another dis or a different decision. And we could have used okay, that so money well, in ten years, you know. <laughs> we could. That's right. What was the ninest thing that I passed down to you guys? Mm. That's tricky. I know. There you go. Quietness. <laughs> yeah. Stay quiet. Stay <laughs> Don't quiet. say anything. Don't assert your presence. I'm trying to think. I mean, I feel like you passed down more how I can get along better with my husband, who's a nine. <laughs> like, That's I understand him. He, literally, the other day, he was like, I feel like me and your mom are more similar than I think. And I'm like, Yes, you are. Because yeah. <laughs> there's so many okay. things I just understand about a nine. Now, this is very, very closely held secret in our family. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. It's never been public. No, it has been pu shared amongst friends. But mom asked you at one point, mm -hmm. what type do you not want to marry? <laughs> and they both at the same time, said, when they were teenagers, they both said, oh, Definitely not a nine. And I just, my eyes were open and my, I was like, what is You probably wanted it like, me? no, it's what you were supposed to say a six, like your dad. You don't want to yeah. marry your dad. I was like, what are they I saying said, about me? It was like with a nine, I was constantly fearful. Like I'm just too intense. Like I just can't handle it. Like I'm going to bulldoze over them and it's going to be bad. And then I also didn't want to marry six because I was like, then it's just too much pessimism. But <laughs> you know. Wait. You mean realism? Oh, thank you very oh, much for the on. correction. Yes. Hold on. Our battery's exhausted. I haven't seen that. Oh. Off signal. Uh, yeah. Um, that does not make sense. You always have a battery. Hold on. He has a battery somewhere. Wait, what is, is the camera not, like, plugged into the charger? Um, well, it is. Yeah, I'm not sure how to explain it. Do you need me to do it, sweetie? Are you okay? It's a little hard to put the battery inside. Yeah, but I just wanted to know if it has charged. I mean, it's back on. Oh yeah, now it is. Because of where the it connects into the camera, sometimes that charger gets disconnected. It's been left on for a while. Girls, put them in their kennel. Girls, go kennel. Go. This only has happened like one or two yeah. times, and sometimes it's even happened because it's hot and it says it's eighty degrees in here. I don't feel like it's eighty, but. I just roast. 
Dad's exchanging the battery. Oh, it's a very sexy moment here. We're going to come back and we've got two imprisoned dogs. I know. I just know they're going to start fighting. I'm so excited to see how little Gills interacts with them as he becomes a toddler. He's already watching them. Like if we if they start walking around, he'll like follow them and look at them and it's so precious. We're like starting to let them lick him more and more because we're like we've got to let them get used to it and know Actually, kind of the boundaries. But you gotta push the camera I guess the other way. Opposite. Okay. Right there. A little too far. Right right there. Good job. What were Good we job. saying, actually? Shoot. Um, um, nine, or no, no, no. We wouldn't want to marry a nine. Marrying a nine. Yeah. yeah. Should I just redo my thing? or? Yeah. So you didn't want to marry a nine because you're too intense. Didn't want to marry a six because they are too pessimistic and mom corrected you. Oh, yeah. You. So I said, well, actually, it's not pessimism, right? It's realism. I appreciate that. <laughs> I have... <laughs> I have groomed you well. That is what yes. y'all always said. Yours would, you're like, I'm not pessimistic. I'm just being realistic. And then mom would always say, I'm not frustrated. I'm just, and then would explain some other word. She just didn't want to be frustrated. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Or I think it was, I'm not angry. I'm frustrated. Yes. Yeah. It was some it type of, you never wanted of it. to be a bad emotion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, let's see. So Nate, what about you with like, why why did because you're dating a type nine so like uh -huh. <laughs> i just laugh so hard i'm like they're both like dating you know or dating libby's married to a type nine so why why what was your reason at first back in the day saying you didn't want to marry a nine i don't even remember that day so oh really yeah. oh man mm -hmm. i remember it was clear as clear as day <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was personal <laughs> yeah, it was like, what did I do so wrong? <laughs> um, amazing. Yeah, Why would you yeah, want to marry exactly. a nine? I'm so amazing. Um, okay, hold on. Let me look here so we don't miss some key stuff. You can ask them what they would suggest to other parents who might want to start using the Enneagram in their parenting. Well, don't you go ahead and ask that. That's fine. So, say it again. So, one of the questions that for us, we were just trying to figure it out. I, I, I am. I did want to ask you this one thing. Like, if you were to say top five things, parents are notorious going to a conference and bringing that back home, reading a book, bringing that back home, or going on a cruise when you're with your adult, <laughs> your teenage kids. And you want to read a book and implement what you're learning? Yes. Does that sound? That sounds. I, they want to. I've heard of people doing that. Right. You've heard and of people doing that. And announce it to the group. Yeah. This is a great, actually, example of what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like of all the things that we learned and well, you gotta tried share the to story. implement, uh, well, there was a, a small book called Nonviolent Communication. Which you always hate that title. Which oh, it's it's just such a like I, I don't know what to, what how to describe that title. It's just nonviolent communication. So positive communication would yeah. be a way of saying it, <laughs> right? Right. right. Uh, and I wanted to read it and learn how to use that, and so I brought it with us. On, we went on, our family went on a cruise together, and I brought it with us, and and I just said, hey, I'm going to try to do some things differently. This book is very, very, very practical as a communication tool. So I'm going to try and well, start so you doing it. And we're all that. looking at it. It was more so we had What's just that? gotten onto the cruise, like the boat. We had just like, we couldn't get into our room. So we went to lunch, went and sat on the balcony. We have plates full of buffet food. We're just eating. And you just go, I'm reading this book. So I'm going to try some new techniques with our conflict. And we're all about to be crammed into a cruise room. <laughs> and yeah, like a closet where, where four of us are going to live in one room, a closet. 
and we're going to try to implement these new tactics. Man. And we were all like, right, whatever. <laughs> I'm just trying to choose to be a healthier person <laughs> than the rest of us. And I'm exactly. being mocked. No, but, <laughs> no, but I am serious. Like, it is a good example of like probably how not to go about it and not to knock on you, but because we all understood the heart you had for it. But it was just yeah. like, that was where you were at personally. We weren't there yet. And mm -hmm. so like a better way to have done it could have been one, probably not doing it on a cruise, but two, <laughs> um, like asking later, Hey, um, can I share some thoughts and what, what would you guys think about this? Um, and all that kind of stuff. Whereas like what it felt like was just like, Hey, we're going to try this out. And it's like, well, we're, That's we're interesting. not Did you guys, did you, did it land on you that I was going to ask you to implement this as well? I just thought you were going to, you were going to do some juju as a counselor brain. <laughs> and I was just like, well, that's... Hey, counselor Jeff's coming out. <laughs> Well, that's funny because as a nine, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I have to follow along with everyone and do what they say. That's interesting. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I, I wasn't mean, asking anyone to do yeah, what I was doing. It was way. just, I was going to try to change the way I communicated. Now, the funny thing about it is that like, it only took a day that I was like, hey, uh, experiment's over. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll try again <laughs> later. Like, you were getting annoyed at something and you were like, I'm done. I'm done trying this. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys, I think we even like, poked fun or made it like more tricky yeah. for him yeah. <laughs> like I mocking him making fun of you for it which <laughs> it is funny because so now funny. like i've taught like my husband and friends i'm like so this is non-violent communication my dad's taught me this yeah. is how you do it like it ended up being very very helpful and fruitful in adulthood yeah. but it was just i will, I will say now well, i think one of the things that i have passed down that's very sexy is my sarcasm and playfulness like you felt the freedom to be able to push back that's true and laugh about it that is not permitted with mom no no. <laughs> no i try i try but then it goes with my own story so sure yeah, yeah. Sure. um but yeah i would say with what with what nate was saying i think for parents who are wanting to implement the enneagram i just wouldn't bring it up for a while like i wouldn't even say like i want to find your type let's talk about it i would just genuinely be like curious about your kid and it does help time. in the kinds of questions that you ask yeah. like yeah. parents as parents it's easy to look at behavior rather than motive well here's the thing yeah. i i just to clarify for the parents we're not saying you're not saying at least i think is yeah use the enneagram all day every day for your own internal work be curious about your kids what could what type could they be but don't use the language of the Enneagram, the complexity of the Enneagram with your kids until much later, because they don't have a framework for that. They don't understand that. And so you can, in the back of your mind, know like, huh, I can see my son, like Nate, I can see he's kind of anxious or worried about something, or he's thinking about a lot of dynamics going on and he's super loyal. Huh, I wonder if he's a six and maybe I'll ask curious questions or like for instance, Nate, one time, um, or no, this was, <laughs> here's a good one for you, Libby, kindergarten Libby. I get called, we get called in, Jeff and I get called in to uh, meet with your teacher. You, um, on the playground in the winter threw a boy across the field as far as you could throw him, And she was telling us about it. And I'm like, Whoa, like what? Like, Libby and but again like you were saying earlier like okay well let's investigate like what in the world happened that's not really typical of her and you were like yeah he was chasing all my friends in a mean way and I had had it and so I just took him and threw him and I was laughing so hard of course we didn't know that you were two back then but I could see that a protective part of you was coming online and that that's why you did it. And so by being curious and asking questions and not trying to like pin you down in your type, 
I got to see a part of you revealed in that moment. And it was like, oh, good for you <laughs> for seeing it the kid. But we can't throw kids, let me, yeah. you know. And so to um, cheer you on in one regard, to say your heart behind that was good, but we can't throw kids. Um, we can't, we just can't do we that. We can't throw kids. <laughs> Yeah, I probably the, said it that way too. Like, so Bible describes a lot of ways <laughs> to resolve conflict. <laughs> Throwing, throwing. You can oh. you can throw tables. Yeah. Jesus did throw he tables. Tossed. He tossed throw. There's the Greek word is <laughs> he did braid the whip. <laughs> throw and toss, and it's a <laughs> genitive version. I don't know. I don't remember any of it. But yeah, you can't throw. And, I, and I so think- what? with what Mm -hmm. you're saying it i think that just it helps as a kid because i mean if you imagine as a kid your parent not just being judgmental of what you do but curious about why you did it it speaks to like oh there's more to me and they actually Mm -hmm. want me to become more of me not just what they want like you didn't just want me to be a kid who conformed to all the rules and like made all my teachers happy but rather you expressed like okay, well, we can't do that. Like as an adult, you are not allowed to just throw people, but you can be protective of people. And it's great that you had that heart. And then you taught me where to put those feelings. And I yeah. think- And then- Go for it. Late, well, I was gonna say later, we, we found out that as a two, that part of you is your eight. Mm-hmm. you know, and she came online and she was like, you are not gonna hurt my friends, you know? And, and that's a part that we love and a part that also needs to be nurtured and um, expressed in healthy ways. And so, you know, it's all in it. But, you know, had we, because there, I will say, you know, for parents out there listening, there were times, and you guys probably don't remember this, but as a nine, I'm like hyper vigilant in reading everyone and is everyone okay? Um, I would use the Enneagram a little from time to time when you were younger. And I could tell that you guys were getting annoyed with it. And so I was like, okay, well, I just won't use the words, but I'll use the Enneagram Mm -hmm. (laughs) in stealth mode um, because I knew it was helpful. And that was okay. It's okay to use it in that stealth mode um, because we we were. I would say that's how we use it with other people most of the time. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because I would say, yeah, even in our family, we're not going around typically going, well, my nine and six, I mean, like we, yeah. we will, but we're, we understand, I guess, the Enneagram so well. And we talk about it often enough that it's like, we just know what we're saying. We have that common language. Um, and yeah, I just, I have found it so helpful to really know you guys in the way that God has created you and to try to be your greatest champion while also in trying to impart the best of what I have to offer and dad to the best that he can, what he has to offer. But even when we do offer the best of what we have, that doesn't mean it landed on you in a way that was beneficial. Sometimes our best landed on you in ways that hurt you. And we've had to like, listen to that, hear that, validate it, apologize in the sense, not apologize so much like, oh, I'm a bad parent. I did something wrong. But that landed on you wrong. It, it, you perceived it wrong. And how can we repair that and let you know what we were intending? And I think that's where the Enneagram can also be powerful. Um, I know Jeff, Nate, you wanted to, to do photography, um, I guess a side hustle in college. And so you were telling us all your plans, this entrepreneur, entrepreneurial plan, and you were, telling us and then dad was you know thinking of okay well all the things you have to think about and plan for and consider well you're already a six and we could really see your countenance fall and here dad was really trying to give the best of who he is as a father but it was crushing you in that moment and I think that was a really how did how was that for you Jeff seeing that with Nate well, the, the Enneagram was a non-judgmental friend. I think that's the word that you've coined for it. In the sense that I under, I had enough, the Enneagram was able to give me enough awareness of myself that I could see what was happening. 
while also not being too critical because it's also part of the gift that I offer. So it it just prevented me from going down a spiral or moving into kind of learned helplessness where, oh, look, I, I just suck as a dad. and mm-hmm. um, or, or get upset with him. Or get upset with him. Like, why aren't you listening to impress my point like, I'm, further? I'm, tr- I'm doing a good thing. I here. realized this was more not about the content of the conversation, but the process. Mm-hmm. And to give him space to know, like, okay, that's what it's like to sit across from me. Uh, but also be a self-aware enough to be able to sit with myself mm. when I think we're missing one another. One way that might help clarify it, and I think this is something that's difficult for a lot of people to grasp, especially in the Christian community, where, you know, we have, um, you know, love others as, you know, you would want to be treated kind of thing. And it's like, on the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, love people as they would want to be treated. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where the the vocabulary of the Enneagram really helps. It, and why we talk so much about being curious. Because, yes, you could say like, well, I love them, you know, how I want to be treated. But sometimes those create mixed signals and the other person doesn't get it because they speak a different language. And so it's not that you can't give of yourself and love that person in a way that you might want to be loved. But it a lot of the times has to be done in their language um, or in ways that they will notice and clearly understand what you're trying to get across. Yeah. Like, you know, for type eights, for them, they're very straightforward, blunt, uh, honest, you know, almost to a fault. Well, that can land on me as a type nine as like, ouch, wow. Well, they're doing it because they don't want to be blindsided or manipulated. It's like, hey, good or bad, just tell me like it is. So they're doing it out of a sense of love and protection for the other person, but it would land on me as a complete opposite. But for me as a nine, I want to offer truth like like a brick with velvet around it, right? Like, Or maybe even more bubble wrap and more bubble wrap. <laughs> and more bubble wrap. Well, that would really not... Like I'm sitting here thinking, I don't want to hurt you, but I'm going to give you truth. Well, that would not land on a type eight as love because it's like, well, where are you coming from? Like, this is so soft and squishy. Like what's actually real here? And so for me, I've had to learn with our type eight friends, our type eight employees that it's most important and beneficial for me to be as straightforward and assertive and honest, even though for me, that can be hard that is more loving for them. But on the flip side, for them to wrap those bricks of truth with at least some sort of bubble wrap <laughs> and and hand that over to me is, is also seeing and showing me love um, as well. And so I think that's what, is that kind of what you're kind of alluding to mm-hmm. and getting at? Yeah, it's a lot of the don't hear what I'm not saying kind of thing of mm-hmm. being aware that what you're saying, even though it's out of, love or the kindness of your heart it just may not be heard through like it's probably not going to be heard through the same ears that you have and so you just have to learn and adjust and that's it only happens out of curiosity Mm -hmm. you're muted libby i keep being muted um it's similar to um mom you and i had a conversation recently where you were like hey, how would it be helpful for me to handle when you talk about this situation that's happening in your life? And I said how like, it's just helpful when people don't say, are you sure that's what's happening? Because Mm -hmm. for me, I can read people so well that I, and also give as a two, give everyone the benefit of the doubt and want to love and want to do everything. So when somebody's like, are you sure they meant it that way? I'm like, well, maybe I should have thought more. Like maybe I should be okay with this. Maybe in like, bend Mm -hmm. over backwards to be okay with things and actually not stand up for myself or just create boundaries and relationships if that's what's best. 
And so it's helpful for you because you're like, oh, yeah, that actually makes sense. That like you don't just think this person's doing this because you're being pessimistic. You actually just know this is what's happening. Um, And so it's similar to that. Yeah. Like just being curious of like my kid. I think the Enneagram shows like your kid can be an amazing human being and they're just going to be different than you most likely. And even if they are the same type, like Nate and dad, like there are going to be differences, but your kid's going to be great. They're going to have a different life than you. And Mm -hmm. if you look forward to all the good things that they can be and you understand that, then there's a way of championing them on to see, okay, yeah, Libby can be really intense sometimes because her eight comes out, but how could that actually be really great for standing up for herself or in the workplace or later when she becomes a mom, instead of just thinking like my kids throwing kids, like we're all doomed, (laughs) like we failed as a parent. (laughs) Um, And so I think it just gives us hope. (laughs) If you want, uh like a visual on how to do this just go watch ted lasso and watch the way that he starts and how he communicates with everyone he communicates with everyone as if they're all sevens and he ends with understanding that they're all different people and he communicates Mm -hmm. to them as the individual that they are now this is kind of an interesting thought that came up as i'm listening to you guys Uh, when we decided that we were going to do a parenting book, mm-hmm. uh, one of our dear friends, and uh, he helps uh, write, helps with writing our books, uh, John Driver, mm-hmm. um, said, hey, you need to talk to your kids first um, because these kinds of parenting books, sometimes it's a problem because, you know, a lot of parenting books are tell the story of the successes more than, you know, how, you know, we're not trying to write a book on we used the Enneagram for 20 years and it didn't work. You know, <laughs> you, you want to you, you want to provide the success. Right. And but the problem is, is that sometimes the stories that are told don't capture everything about what was really going on in the family. I, I, I'm curious from your your guys's perspective, because we, we talked to you about it beforehand and said hey are you good like Mm. are you good with some of the stories that we're going to tell in the book what what really excites you or just gives you the the trust to know like this is not just a success story book that's gonna tell you how beth and jeff mccord were amazing parents because (laughs) they had the enneagram but it was just an honest way of a tool that we use that helped us to stay connected with one another and now into your young adult years. But mm-hmm. I'm wondering, how do you, how did you guys relate to that, that mom was writing a book about our family? Um, I mean, it was cool for me because at the time when you officially decided it, I think I didn't tell you guys that I was pregnant yet, but I was pregnant or mm-hmm. I had just told you that I was pregnant. Um, so that was like a fun thing to be like, oh, wow, like they're going to write this book. It's also coming out on my birthday and like all those fun things. But I thought it was kind of funny when you said it, it made sense why John Driver told us that, like, I I totally get why that could, you know, kind of explode a family, but Mm -hmm. you guys often ask, Hey, is there something we did in your childhood that you didn't appreciate or that we need to apologize for now that you're an adult and you've, you're able to think about it. So it wasn't the first time, probably not even the 10th time you guys have asked that in our life. And it's not the last time. Yeah. <laughs> like well, even we have many years to go. Yeah. And like, you guys are, you guys are just remembering yeah. the things that annoyed you. And so like, hurt I, you. I think for us, like it is a constant conversation because I mean, you guys always apologize throughout childhood as much as you could. And you also couldn't be self-aware enough to cover everything. But we also mm-hmm. now as adults have a lot of grace for, you guys were becoming parents as we were becoming adults. And so you guys couldn't do it perfectly. And so for you guys to share those stories, all I remember is my parents did grow through that. Like they became better parents as I became a kid and became an adult. And so Mm -hmm. even if you share a story of success, I equally can say, yeah, and they screwed up this way and yet they apologize at the same time. Um, And so it's, I would never say like, y'all are the perfect parents. My parents never did anything wrong. But it's more so I know I can tell my parents that they did do something wrong and can even now to this day easily tell you guys like, hey, I didn't like this and we can have a conversation and I don't get anxious about what your reaction is going to be or is it going to go well. 
um, because I know mm -hmm. we're open and honest about it. And so I expected the same of the book. Like if something annoyed me about the book, I could just tell you guys and you guys would own up to it. <laughs> yeah, funny. that's true. Nate, anything from you? Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I think it's a book that's really needed. Um, just for parents to honestly be encouraged that it's a lot messier than people maybe talk about. And we've had probably the most difficult conversations as a family, as Libby and I have been adults. And yet we've also had the most life-giving conversations out of those. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the scary thing about family or just the people you love the most and giving so much trust and uh, vulnerability of who you are um, to someone uh, because, yeah, there's just a lot of room to be hurt. But I think what we've all committed to is learning how to love ourselves and love the Lord. Um, and from that, we're able to love each other um, at a much deeper level. And so I think this book is really going to help parents understand that Yes, it's going to be messy and it is as difficult as they're saying, like not to discount anything, but just to give hope that that they really can have just an honest and loving relationship with their kids if mm -hmm. they're patient um, with their kids and then they're they just attune to themselves and, and do their own work first. And that's going to be the challenge of the book too, um, that it will challenge you as parents to check in with yourself and to care for yourself first. But it really is how relationships thrive. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so to end, well, let's end on a fun note. I know y'all are surprised because I'm usually not the fun, funny one in the family. But we did this a, w a little while back, and we all really laughed at it. So what what is the one thing that I, your mom, say the most? And what is the one thing your dad is a six? What, would, what does he typically say the most? So start with me. What do I typically say that's very 90 Mm. trying to think oh you could never get me to do something you can never get Beth <laughs> to do a lot of things that take effort <laughs> and you won't be asking her to do it but you'll show her that you're doing something and it takes a lot of effort and she'll tell you you can never get me to do that I can't <laughs> <laughs> and then and then like what if I mean one of the phrases is I I just don't understand. Yeah, you don't understand yeah. a lot. Like I don't yeah. understand how I don't understand. That. I don't that's understand. the that's the nice nine way of saying I'm kind of judging this this situation <laughs> or this person. <laughs> but then the one that you said this time that made me laugh so hard is you said, Oh mom, the thing you always say that I remember is I'm out. Yep. <laughs> yeah. She's out of a lot of things. <laughs> like I'm done. I'm out. Yep. See ya. Checked out. Okay, so what about dad? He's mindful. Uh, <laughs> he's mindful. <laughs> oh, one of my favorites is not just that he's mindful, but you will you'll all of a sudden get quiet and you'll just be like, I want like time of peace. Not like peace. What would he say, Nate? When he's like being contemplative or he wants us to be serious, no joking. Like yeah. all of a sudden being very in your head about stuff and me and Nate just lose it laughing I'm at you. <laughs> I'm gonna be vulnerable here. <laughs> yeah. And it like we would be laughing like this, and all of a sudden, I want to be vulnerable here. Yeah. And it's like I don't know how we're supposed to like. It's like Michael Scott, like snip, snap, snip, snap, snip, yeah. snap. <laughs> it's like a back and That's forth a, of like. I remember you guys saying that I said uh, that can mean a lot of different things. Yes. Oh yeah. That can be a lot of different things, or that, that can was very frustrating things. because it's like. 
like what are we supposed to do with that like <laughs> if you just say that about everything there's no answer to anything it never ends exactly <laughs> welcome to jeff's <laughs> welcome mind welcome to the world of a six <laughs> Welcome well, to thanks. this news that Jeff McCord invented postmodernism. <laughs> All from one saying. Well, thanks guys for just hopping on here. You know, obviously we talk about this stuff all the time and have fun. Um, one making fun of ourselves and stuff, but you know, just I think it's gonna be really helpful for parents to hear from adult kids who literally their parents used it from when they were, you know, toddlers all the way up to now in your mid late early to mid 20s and still using it and i think uh, there's also um, we noticed that people think this book is for young moms mm-hmm. and it's like no this is equally for young We're moms still using it with adult children yeah, yeah grandmas adult kids great grandmas this is really about having relationship with those in your your life your family um use it you know, dads, hey, yeah, read about it, not only just for yourself and gain some perspective, but learn about what it's like, you know, from your wife's perspective, being a mom. I honestly think Uh, that they mm -hmm. will experience more of the results of the book when their kids are older. But if you use this as a young mom, it will prepare you to handle much more difficult things later on. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thanks guys. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for um, being willing to follow our lead on a lot of things, even though sometimes we've led you into the pitfalls sure. of life, but then uh, uh, forgave us. Uh, for the mess ups that we did do along the way, we really appreciate that. They and didn't say they forgave us. So that, that might be an assumption. <laughs> that that's true. No, they did in the moment when we asked. Maybe not now. Exactly. But anyway, of course. Uh, well, we love you guys and really appreciate you. Love yeah. you too. Love you guys. Well, I hope that you guys had a lot of fun listening to my family. That is typical McCord family bantering back and forth, having a lot of fun, mainly the three of them. And I'm trying to hang in there. Um, But I hope that you guys had a lot of fun listening and hearing the highs and the lows of our family and what it's been like to use the Enneagram when our kids were younger, but also as now they're grown adults. So I hope that was really beneficial for you. And I really do hope that you will um, purchase my new book, Enneagram for Moms. You can get it at Enneagramformoms.com. And if you get it before July 9th, we have a lot of pre-order bonuses. So this is probably the time to jump in and get your copy. And thank you guys so much for your support, listening. Uh, Please share this with other uh, friends, parents, moms, those that would really benefit from this podcast. And next time we are going to talk, Jeff and I are going to dive more deeply in what it's like to use the Enneagram from a new mom now that I am also a grandma. So what is that like in all the different seasons of life? So join us next time for that fun conversation.